Another application of Gauss's law is for finding the electric field produced by a highly symmetric charge distribution. You may ask, don't we already have Coulomb's law to use to find the electric field produced by a charge distribution? Why do we need another law? Because in certain highly symmetric situations, Gauss's law can make things a lot easier. Consider a non-conducting sphere with a radius big R and a net charge of positive Q that is uniformly distributed throughout the entire volume of the sphere. Find the electric field a distance little r from the center. Part A is when little r is smaller than big R. And part B is when little r is bigger than or equal to the big R. To use Gauss's law, we need to make a closed Gaussian surface for this integral of e dot dA, which equals to the magnitude of the electric field times the magnitude of the dA times the cosine the angle between E and the dA. Although Gauss's law involves an integral, we really are not interested in doing any complex integration. If there is complex integration involved, Coulomb's law would be an easier law to use. In any case, how to not involve complex integration? We will need the magnitude of the electric field to be the same everywhere on the Gaussian surface. So we can take E out of the integration. We will also need the angle between E and the dA to be the same everywhere so we can take the cosine out as well. This way, the only thing left here is the integral of dA, which means that we just need to add all the little area dA and find the total area for this integral. Since this equals to Q enclosed over epsilon naught, we just need to divide Q enclosed over epsilon naught by cosine and by the area, we will be able to arrive at the electric field we're looking for. And remember this E is the magnitude of the electric field on the Gaussian surface. So we need the electric field to have the same strength everywhere on the Gaussian surface, and also to have the same angle between the electric field and the outward normal vector dA. And since we're looking for the electric field here, we have to make sure that this location is on our Gaussian surface. So what Gaussian surface should we make? A sphere with a radius little r. So it would go through the point we're interested in. By symmetry, everywhere on this Gaussian surface, the electric field has the same strength so we can take E out of the integral. And since this is a spherically symmetric positive charge distribution, the direction of the electric field would point radially outward and in the same direction as the outward normal vector dA everywhere on the Gaussian surface. Therefore, this is a constant cosine zero degrees and can be taken out of the integral. And of course, cosine zero degrees is one. So this is E times the total area of the Gaussian surface. Since the Gaussian surface is a sphere, so the surface area of the sphere is four pi r squared, and the Gaussian surface has a radius of little r, so we're using little r squared here. So the electric field is this divided by that, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q enclosed over R squared. But what is the Q enclosed? It is not positive Q, because the Gaussian surface is only this big. The charges inside the Gaussian surface is less than positive Q. Closed 
is only a fraction of the positive Q. Since the charge is uniformly distributed throughout the entire volume, the fraction here is also the fraction of the volume. And the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is proportional to r cubed. So this fraction of the enclosed charge is the r cubed, the little r cubed, divided by the big r cubed because it is the volume of the Gaussian surface out of the volume of the entire non-conducting sphere. If we plug this in, we will get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times 1 over r squared times uh, little r cubed divided by big r cubed times big Q, which gives us uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times uh, Q over big R cubed times R. Now let's find the electric field outside this non-conducting sphere. Again, we will start from Gauss's law, and we're going to make a Gaussian surface so that we will be able to take out the magnitude of E and uh, take out the cosine and then be left with only the closed integral of dA because we still have spherical symmetry, we would make a spherical Gaussian surface again because it has to go through the location we are interested in. This Gaussian surface has our new little r for radius. By symmetry, everywhere on the Gaussian surface, the electric field has the same strength, so we take E out of the integral. Since we have positive charges here, the electric field direction will go radially outward, which is in the same direction as the outward normal vector dA. So we will have cosine 0 degrees, and cosine 0 degrees is 1. So this is uh, the electric field times 1, and then times the total area of this new Gaussian surface is 4 pi times the new r squared. Now we can divide this by that to get the electric field, which is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q enclosed over R squared. This time, the entire positive Q is inside the Gaussian surface. So the Q enclosed is positive Q. So the electric field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times big Q over little r squared. And if we need the directions for the electric field, we will say that they are radially outward, radially outward. You may have noticed that since uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is K, these are just like Coulomb's law. The electric field produced by a point charge is KQ over r squared. This is because a single point charge also has a spherical symmetry. So for spherically symmetric charge distributions, we can either use Gauss's law or Coulomb's law to find the electric field. Since we found E as functions of little r for all values of little r, we can also plot an electric field versus the r graph within the uniform charge distribution the electric field is linearly related to little r. And on the outside, the electric field is proportional to 1 over r squared, which means uh, when r doubles, the field strength becomes uh, 1 fourth.